Hello, and welcome to the Emerging Consciousness Global Online Festival, a kaleidoscope of voices and perspectives on awakening. Here we are gathering with transformative coaches, cultural creatives, visionary artists, an eclectic mix of wisdom keepers blended with colorful new voices in order to create a catalyzing space where curious people come for fearless and experiential learning. Thank you for being a part of this transpersonal movement to liberate minds, supercharge consciousness, and activate the farthest reaches of our human potential in order to create a more peaceful and evolved world. I'm Tammy Mensch, a transformative life and spiritual business coach, founder of the Kaleidoscope Lounge and Coaching, and uh, creator and host of this event. I serve people on a journey to fullness of expression, authenticity, joy, and deep wisdom. Uh, those brave souls who sense that change is imminent and long to connect with what makes them feel most fully alive and the gifts that they were born to bring into this world. And that's what this event is all about. And I am so pleased to welcome today, Cater Brown, who is a ceremonialist, teacher, intuitive, and, um, and is an amazing uh, the founder and director of the Rites of Passage Council. Welcome, Cater. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, your introductions sound really great. I want to, I want to be there. <laughs> you are there. <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk about something really interesting today, um, in bulk, which um, is uh, um, the the title is the from the belly of the earth we awaken. Cater, tell us a little bit about your topic and what we're, we would like to talk about today. It's so interesting. Thank you. Yes. So the, the topic has to do with the day of this interview, which, as we know, it's when this airs will actually be a little bit past the uh, spring equinox. But when I looked at our, our schedule for the interview, I thought, oh, this is this is in bulk or most of us know it as Groundhog Day. Um, so in the ancient ways, or the, the, we could say the Celtic markings of the seasons, um, the beginning of February, around somewhere, it would fluctuate a few days, like this would, would mark that, uh, kind of the, the beginning actually of spring. Um, and the story, I mean, well, most of us are familiar with Groundhog Day. So... By the way, Groundhog came out of its hole today, or maybe didn't. It snowed last night here, but um, to see its shadow or not, and if it doesn't, there's six more weeks of winter. In the ancient story, it's about the goddess Bridget, and um, it was about a snake that emerged. So it, it's this day has this energy of emergence, of newness, of you know the the hope for spring to return. Um, it's all the kind of energies that are circulating and have circulated around this few days uh, for you know thousands of years. So I just wanted to name that when I was thinking of a title, I thought of the you know simply the word in bulk from the from the belly of the earth we awaken. Is that in that is the old mythology of of rising up. Um, and this, um, the context of awakening, um, like to awaken to what may be the question. <laughs> Sometimes people awaken and they look around and it's like, oh, this is, this is not even my life, or I haven't been living a life that I feel deeply aligned with or, or connected. It's been in service to something, something else. And maybe we discover that at a certain age um, and we feel this, like it, like an old pair of shoes that doesn't fit anymore, all of a sudden it's uncomfortable. Um, I think planetarily we have entered and have been in that, that say the alchemical fire of transformation or threshold time where uh, we're no longer where we were, but we're not yet where we're headed. Um, so we're somewhere between 
uh, a memory and a dream. And in that place, in that threshold, is a great deal of uncertainty. As one of my favorite uh, eco-philosophers, Joanna Macy, says, it's when we are when we find ourselves on the knife's edge of uncertainty, that's where our greatest creative potential wakes up, comes alive. Um, and so there's there's opportunity here to to uh, as we find ourselves on that that knife's edge of uncertainty, not to deaden it, not to look away, um, not to pretend as if, not to grasp for the old, um, but somehow to hold. Uh, hold that still point um, so that something new, something, uh, a third thing, as they say, can emerge. Um, something outside of our own, you know, limited strategic thinking mind. I forgot who the, 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 the one who's credited with that saying that we can't change things with the same thinking that got us into the mess that we're in. Albert Einstein. <laughs> that was, uh, that's it. Albert. So this, um, so how do you awaken to something new that's that's uh, maybe in shadow, maybe a blind spot? It's like we don't know what we don't know. Um, and as one of my teachers, Rockenberry, used to say to me, he said, um, "You know, there's the things you don't know, and then there's the things you don't know you don't know. Hmm. You wouldn't even think to ask about or or consider." But that's the territory we're being asked to cultivate. Um, the things we don't know, we don't know. Um, and I think it's coming in with the newer generations. Uh, the young people carry the, they're, they're the tip of the spear of evolving consciousness uh, on the planet. Um, and the one thing the young people and the elders have in common is they both have a foot in the other world. So somehow if we can get these two groups to talk to each other while those of us in the middle are kind of fumbling around, um, there's, there's richness in these areas. Um, and yet in our, in our society, we tend to put those on the sidelines, um, those young, brilliant minds or those elders. Um, and yet that's the place, that's, that's often the place of, of conversation that these uh, new things emerge from. So it's um, so it's real fitting for this time, for this you know this moment that you and I are sitting here on um, this date, and then the moment that this is going to be airing later, just after the uh, spring equinox. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, planetary uh, nature cycles, rhythms of support, at least in in the northern hemisphere of the planet. I want to really thank you for um, naming that and um, and ah. connecting it with the 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 purpose of this you know this event, which is emerging consciousness. It 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 the the timing and the the uh, the topic are so uh, relevant and resonant. And where we are and in this in this time, this liminal space, um, where so much is possible. I I know that. Um, I, I feel fully alive during this time mm -hmm. um, with just so much uh, potential and, um, and, and the way that you talk about connecting the, uh, the, the elders with the, the newer you know, generation, it, 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 takes, it takes all of us, <laughs> all yeah. of us are needed. All of our gifts, all of our perspectives are needed uh, to help to move forward during this time. So. Thank you for putting that all into such, you know, beautiful context. Yeah, it's it's fascinating time to be alive. <laughs> it really is. You talk about, you know, awake, uh, awaken to what, you know, <laughs> and um, so how, you know, how how do we awaken to, you know, this evolutionary consciousness? So we could even say awaken to who, mm. to what, to who. Um, and, you know, one of the ceremonies that I've been uh, closely aligned with in my life, the Vision Fast or Vision Quest, um, this way of, of what we would say walking the wheel, uh, of getting to the place of when you go up on the mountain because you're, you're seeking a new vision so that your people may live, we would say. 
Um, you go up there with a uh, surrender to the old. You, you've let go, um, and you don't know yet what's to come. Uh, so you you go up with uh, open palms and empty heart and empty belly. Um, and if if we can somehow um, approach the sacred with a, a, a certain humbleness and openness, uh, we may find that the sacred will approach us. Um, and there's something that happens uh, out there in that experience um, of this uh, surrendering beyond the, the comfortable ground of beliefs or uh, old spiritual roadmaps. It's like to go a little far beyond uh, beliefs and surrender into the into the arms of the unknown to something greater than ourselves. So I um, thought we'd begin or deepen our beginning with this uh, interview with an invocation um, of acknowledgement. Um, and first I would like to, uh, in terms of acknowledging and gratitude and humbleness to acknowledge the um, the original uh, custodians of this land where I am in these mountains of North Carolina, um, the Cherokee people and their ancient ways and uh, those threads of, of memory and belonging that they've left in the soil and, and um, that tends to guide us if we can find find it underneath a rock or behind a tree. Um, so I just want to acknowledge those, those original custodians of the land uh, that we have the privilege to actually live on and have this conversation from. Um, and, uh, and also to my teachers, uh, Cherokee elder Will Rocking Bear um, and his teachers before him and uh, another of my teachers, Melodoma Somme, and his teachers before him um, to offer my deep gratitude um, and hope that they, they all give me something adequate to say today. We'll see. <laughs> I'm already moved. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, pick up my rattle here, this one here, and um, invite you to close your eyes and take yourself, imagine, or send your spirit, you might say, to a place in nature that you know and that knows you. Um, a place that remembers your name. It may be in your backyard. Um, if you live in a high rise, it may be on, you know, the gardens on the rooftop, anywhere, or a park, or deep in the wilderness. Um, and so take yourself there. And as we begin this invocation, um, I want you to turn in that place and see yourself facing the rising sun. And we'll start there. Hmm. The Creator, great spirit, great mystery. We are grateful for our lives. We're grateful for the, to be alive on the planet at this time. We stand and face the east, the rising sun, the place of new beginnings and fresh new starts. That place of seeing for the first time everything. To be able to look in the mirror at ourselves as if having never seen ourselves before. To look in the eyes of our children, our lovers, our associates with new eyes. The willingness to drop the old stories so that the mystery of who each of us are can once again emerge. We call upon that good medicine of the East, of Eagle and Condor and all those high flyers that show us how to see the big picture in our lives and how to also focus on the tiny details. We call on the good medicine of springtime, of this in bulk day, of this awakening, this rising from the dreaming of the earth. We call upon this good medicine of the East to invite you into this circle, into this gathering, into this festival to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. Uh -huh. 
Now a quarter turn to the right. I invite you to now turn and face the south in this place in nature that you see yourself. We call upon the good medicine people of the south, this place of warm summer breezes, a place of passion and playfulness and creativity, that energy of manifesting, the element of fire. We call upon integrity and impeccability and courage, that place where our words and our thoughts and our actions and our feelings are exactly the same. And we call upon that deep wisdom and courage from the South, the coyote, the jumping mouse, the rattlesnake, and all of those good medicine people of the South, we invite you into this circle, to this gathering, to this festival, to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. I hope. Now we quarter turn again to the West. Turning towards the West, we call upon the good medicine people of autumn, of the great harvest, of bear, jaguar, the place of initiation and transformation, of turning inward, sap beginning to recede on the vine, cooler nights of autumn, bright colored leaves overhead and on the ground type of place. We call upon this element of water and healing and reconciliation, forgiveness. And we reach out with humble hearts, with open hearts, and invite the good medicine people of the West of Autumn to come into our circle. We ask that you awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. I hope. In quarter turn again to the right, we face north. Turning toward the spirit of winter, to the sacred mountain, to the story keepers those hearth fires that burn in our homes and lodges, to the place of letting go and self-acceptance, place of grace and prayer, the place where we learn to let go so fully and completely that spring simply shows up because we let go enough. So we'll call out to the sacred mountain of the north and invite this good medicine people of the north into this circle, to this gathering, to this festival, to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. Oh. We're reaching our arms skyward. We call it upon Sky Nation. Grandmother Moon, Grandfather Sun, our star sisters and brothers and others. And Grandmother Moon, we thank you for teaching us how to bring those things that were held in the dark and bring them into the light over and over again. To talk about those things that are sometimes hard and painful to talk about. To look at those things and bring them into the light that sometimes we would rather not look, about, look at. Grandmother Moon, we thank you for these teachings that you offer us. Grandfather Son, we thank you for shining down your bright morning star on us each day, teaching us about falling down seven times and getting up eight, always eight. To get up and need to do what to do what needs to be done. And to our star sisters and brothers and others, we thank you for your lights, your reminders. We thank you for shining down your lights upon us and reminding us, too, that we can learn to shine as a beacon of light and such that you could see us from out there by the way we live our lives. Much gratitude. We acknowledge you and we welcome you. 
I invite you into the circle, this gathering, this festival, to awaken those bits of stardust that resides within our bone memory. So then remember who we are. Uh -huh. Now turning down toward the earth, maybe seeing ourselves placing our hands on the earth or belly on the earth, touching the ground, feeling the soil and soul of Mother Earth beneath us. We thank you for all things green and growing. We thank you for teaching us about balance. And that scarcity is only an illusion that spun out of control when we live out of balance with you. So we thank you for teaching us how to dream again and how to listen to the dreaming of the earth so that our dreams align with those dreams once again. That we'll be able to dream a new earth for our great-grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. We thank you for home and belonging and place and connection. With much gratitude, we welcome you to the circle to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. I hope. And looking behind us to those seven generations and beyond of ancestors, we thank you for your footprints and your heartbeats, for your tears and your laughter. And we thank you for dreaming us into this place. We specifically call upon those bright and shiny ancestors, those that lived well and died well, and those that are well in spirit at this time, to assist us in navigating these uncertain waters. We welcome you to assist us in healing any of those that remain unhealed. We thank you. And to those ancestors that are in front of us, those seven generations and beyond that lives in the dreams and the visions of many of our bellies. We thank you for watching to see what we do, watching to see how we live our lives so you will know what to do when you get here. We thank you for that immense trust and that immense accountability. May we be worthy of it. And that you find this place a welcoming place when you arrive. With much gratitude. Oh. Now to the spirits of the land around you now. To the standing tall people, the plant medicine people, the swimmers in the rivers and seas, the crawlers in the earth and on the earth the four-legged and two-legged and winged ones of the lands that are around you. We acknowledge you. We thank you for those reminders that we are not separate and continuing to nudge us back into alignment with you. And may we learn to walk in balance and in good relationship with all our peoples, human and non-human, living and non-living. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Uh -huh. And to the great council that sits on the other side of this fire, tending those coals and keeping them hot. May the way in which we tend the fire on this side be a blessing to you and to all our relations. And may the way in which we live our lives continue to bless those in front of us and those behind us. Blessed be. I hope. Now take a deep breath and let it go and then open your eyes and plant your feet on the ground. Oh, I feel so um, connected Yeah. and, and, and grateful.
I'm tearing up too. <laughs> <laughs> Tears are, uh, somebody asked me about grief one time. I said, grief is the great connector, you know, that when we, um, when we're able to access our grief, then we're able to connect. Um, and petrified grief turns into fear and anger and all these other secondary things that we begin to struggle with. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big uh, proponent of large grief rituals. <laughs> <laughs> that include tears. Tears, tears for me um, signal that I, I'm feeling truth. Mm -hmm. And that's how I I connect. That's how I know that what I'm feeling is is true to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. when it comes out my eyes. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good, good barometer for. Me. <laughs> feel a twinge. I go okay. Truth meter right there. To yeah. feel truth is to be aligned with a truth that we each carry. Mm. Um, there's something resonant. Uh, in this this thing we call truth is not simply just existing outside of ourselves but reminding us of some original blueprint of knowing uh often in a language beyond words that that is only in tears like i say if the the only prayer one can offer is their tears that's 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 plenty <laughs> words often get in the way of good prayers right. isn't language for it all uh, all the time exactly yeah <clears throat> and awakening to um you know this this if i follow that thread this awakening to truth um to to um to awaken to something new to is really to connect more deeply to an authentic self um and and yet how do we find that how do we navigate our way to that place or how do we even know we're not there you know what what in our lives tells us we're either connected or not connected to it um and uh there's a um man by the name of og mandino that wrote a book that many people know called the greatest salesman in the world or universe or something uh you know it's like i think 40s or 50s and he had this little quote, and I always I latched onto this quote because I love it. And it's like, well, how do you know if you're not aligned with some authentic uh, navigational instrument within yourself? Um, and he had this quote that says, if, if I said to you, all of the things that you say to yourself about yourself, would you and I be friends? <laughs> 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 and many times I'll say, if I say that to people and they'll think, uh, you know, no, I don't, probably not. <laughs> it's like, well, that's where we have to start. Um, yeah, that can but, grow. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I was, uh, uh, was at a, a circle one time with Rocking Bear and, and um, he, one of the people in the audience asked him, said, uh, you know, so much violence in the world. And this was years ago, but obviously that hasn't changed. Um, what do we do? And he thought for a minute, he said, we have to stop the violence. And then he paused and he said, but I'm talking about the violence that we do to ourselves in our own head. Um, that violence, that's where we have to start. Um, so how do you, how do you become aware of that? I think by, um, decreasing the noise and the stimulation around you so you can notice what's going on within you. Um, it's one of those, uh, one of the navigational tools that I use, I think even before we started the, the interview recording, you'd asked me a question about, well, how do you, how do you access that place? And I thought, I started thinking about how do I, um, when I'm successful, I think I'll call my attention to the present moment, um, as if. Uh, the present moment is a, a doorway, a portal. And it doesn't mean uh, that it necessarily feels good, but to feel the present moment alive and deeply um, opens something. It's like uh, ritual invocation is a very present moment experience. Um, I like to say that ritual, 
when people ask me about ritual, I say, well, ritual is nonsense. And they thought, you know, one surprise that I would say it. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, ritual is not for your mind to be making sense of when you're in it. You'll do that next week when you think about it. When you're in it, um, your mind should not be the one that's running the show. Your, your awareness, your uh, sensory experience, uh, that, that other information, that's what's engaged. Um, once the mind comes in, then you're not there. Um, and so it's an interesting, how do you access that point? I think all the sacred traditions of the planet have methods they teach, be it prayer or meditation or uh, questing or, you know, different traditions have ways to access this, this place that they teach. Um, but I think it, it can be as simple as, um, yeah, just taking a moment to be still and quiet in the noise around you and noticing the, the noise within you that starts to rise up. I call these the gatekeepers um, because those gatekeepers kind of stand between you and uh, the other side you know, when, you, when you break through that. Um, rattle when you were playing the rattle or music. <laughs> Uh -huh. Music is a beautiful, it, it bypasses the thinking mind, music, poetry. Um, there's a way in which these, uh, using imaginal language has a way of activating um, a conversation with the sacred. Um, it, it's the one, one of the great things that have suffered in uh, that our children have suffered from and, and is this loss of imagination um, and creativity um, when everything is served up as a stimulation on a, on a pad or, or something in front of you there's no exercise of imagination and you can probably I don't know if you can find people these days but so I was a kid of the 60s a child of the 60s so um, you know, my mom would say, well, get out of here, go outside and play. And you go outside and it's like, you know, there's trees and there's where I live, there was marsh and uh, seawater. And, and it's like you sit there and all of a sudden start, something starts to happen that you didn't know was going to happen. Um, and then all of a sudden you're into something, like your imagination takes over. Um, and so I think we've we've lost this relationship to the the... the, the numinous or luminous, the imaginal realm um, oftentimes gets put in the category of something not true, like right. myth. Um, and yet, now I say the imaginal realm is the, the, um, the language of interface with the, with, uh, the sacred. Um, because it's the only way we can communicate. We can't communicate in languages that we don't know. It would be like, you know, I don't speak Japanese, but if I went to Japan and said tree, nobody's likely going to know what I'm talking about. Or if they said tree in their language, it's like there's no interface of connection. And so our imagination is that, that realm of, of interfacing with the sacred um, that we want to be able to access through some creative means or stillness. And that's, that's the place where um, <clears throat> we have to grow into that, that to um, live into our fullest, you know, reaches of our human potential, where we're so limited, where, you know, that's the, that's the place where we can expand and, 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 and haven't utilized, you know, to, to its fullest where we can go mm -hmm. uh, from here. Yeah. Right. And, and getting there is not... When I mentioned the word gatekeepers, it's what I call these these places within ourselves and outside of ourselves that are um, are the gatekeepers that we have to acknowledge to um, to be able to step through past the, the the old ways of thinking, living, being, doing that has in some way served to protect us physically or psychically. Um, and you can't just throw them out of the way and step into you know this this state of awareness. 
um, there has to be a reconciliation uh, at the gate with the gatekeepers. You know, and, and mythologies when you come to some threshold and there's somebody on the bridge, or you have to have this kind of uh, solve this riddle <laughs> or um, pass this test, or or and and even regardless of what happens, there's always some kind of like scar or wound or thing that happens to mark that you had the, the interchange. Um, and so there's this way that when we begin to uh, seek out these experiences, um, like on, on through the ceremony of the vision fast or vision quest, when you're when you go out on the mountain, you know, it takes sometimes a day or two for your mind to be quiet. Um, and uh, and Maybe three days. That's why we send people for four. Hopefully, four will do it. But eventually, um, what stands between um, ourselves and that stillness, that that quiet, are all the things that begin, all the unresolves that begin to cycle up. Um, the, the petrified grief that we didn't know was grief um, begins to come out, or. Um, and, and we begin to, to feel ourselves breaking open again. Um, and, and it's with that, uh, that breaking open that we break, you know, break open, break through, break down, kind of all the same thing is, is entering into something um, that uh, the, the very entrance requires humility, requires um, a humble heart, an open heart. And um, it cannot be simply choreographed um, that one says, I'm going to go do this. When I hear people say, I'm going to go do a letting go ceremony. And, I've, and it, this is what it looks like. And it's what I'm going to do. <laughs> that's, that's, a good, that's a good start. You know, to, to truly let go is not a in control choreographed uh, experience. <laughs> um, say more about that. You know, well, it's something that... Uh, you know, I love the, the, the um, in many indigenous languages, they have use of way more verbs than we have in the English language. So we can kind of paint that picture. And language informs perception. I'm going to establish that. Shared language informs shared perception. Um, so you can all of a sudden see that our, our ability to perceive something is, is gauged by our language and what it affords us to be able to, to use and then a shared language and strengthens these perceptions. When you use a language that is not as alive as a language that is say tonal or a language that has m more use of verbs, uh, then you have a way in which you are constantly disengaging from your experience. Um, so if, imagine for a moment, I'm looking at this, this uh, behind you, there's a, a poster of a, a tree. Yes. It's in South Africa. It looks, yeah, I was going to say the tree itself looks like, a, um, uh, I think in Africa they call them baobab, in Australia they call them boab trees. They have these big fat trunks and these little squiggly limbs. And uh, but imagine you're standing with this being, and you have a name. Maybe you know the name of it. Maybe it's oak. Maybe it's maple. Maybe it's the boab tree. Um, and then for a moment, I want you to forget the name. And now you're standing with this thing you have no name for. And so what happens is you're perceptually you're drawn in and engaged in a relational experience that the moment I name it, I'm out of engagement with it. Um, the moment I categorize it, I'm way far. So that, you know, people keep, you joke about the thing called the green wall as a reference to nobody really, and the green wall is being trees, you know, like trees, green. Um, it's like there's no relationship. And so in, in, in a living, alive, verbal language, things were always moving. A table wouldn't be a table, it would be tabling. And so if, if, if something is described as a verb, you're held in a relational context of interaction, it's constantly changing. 
um, instead of a classification system that we then disengage from and go, you know, record other bits of pieces of information. So this, um, so this way of engaging uh, and entering into relational context is what we're really talking about, to be in relationship. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that destroys uh, relationships, human to human the most, is when we create a story about ourselves or each other, and then we um, trap people in those stories, trap ourselves in a story, trap them in a story, and then we can't see anything else. Um, whereas with a, uh, a living, changing relationship, you can't do that. It's impossible. You can't trap something in a fixed way of knowing it. Um, so it's always alive. There's always like some mystery that can present itself. Um, and so simply to, to take a walk in nature. And we could even say that learning the specific names of things, because we've gotten so disconnected from relationship, that that actually can help um, to know that there is a difference between an oak and a maple and a hemlock and, you know, and, and beech and all these other trees and sparrow and wren and hawk and... Um, to learn the names is a, actually a closer step in of relating. Um, and then to, to shift to more that meditative place where you drop the name completely and you're held in some other kind of uh, relational experience. Um, that's, that's more that medita that's more that shift. I think that's what happens when people go on the mountain. Um, to quest, um, I love the uh, the Lakota, Lakota word, and I may uh, forgive me if I say this word incorrectly, but the meaning being um, uh, to cry for a vision, to hemblecha, uh, hemblecha ceremony, to cry for a vision is, is the translation roughly. Um, so it, it speaks of an experience. Not, a, not of a thing that you do, but actually experience you have. Um, and so there's this, uh, there's this openness, there's this surrender, there's this to, to something unknown that gives us access, uh, doesn't guarantee it, makes us available to receive grace. You know, it's, it's um, I think I said earlier, when, when, when we approach uh, that which is sacred with an open heart, with a humble heart, that which is sacred will approach us. Um, otherwise, we're just chasing it. Um, and so it does require this, this letting go. Um, this, this open, uh, it's called the open palms, empty heart uh, place. And what's, what's coming up for me is <clears throat> how important it is to hear this now. You know, um, where we are, we are uh, being asked to um, to reimagine and to uh, be in 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 relationship with nature, but is also with each other. You know, in 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 new ways. And yes, seeing the trees and um, and and nature, uh, being with them and in non-language um, also with you know with people to see them in the in the same way not to put words or you know a definitions around who they are but to see them unfolding in their presence in that moment too is um is important yeah, I mean, the, the, the times that we're in where there's so much polarization of identity and belonging um, and adversarial uh, perspectives across those lines of perception, um, you know, it's uh, to let go of the stories that we have about another. Um, and then being able to notice what can emerge. It's like as long as we have that in place, uh, being able to to use some political terms of bipartisan conversation <laughs> or, or uh, coming together um, doesn't happen because all these fixed ways of, of seeing each other is impossible. We can't meet each other 
authentically. Um, and there's a lot of disconnection uh, of people in, in service to other other things, um, other other uh, mythologies, if you will, um, that don't uh, avail themselves to that kind of connection. I mean, it's like it's. Uh, let me say a little more about that. This this uh, in an in initiatory rites of passage societies. The idea that we come into this, this realm of existence uh, because we have come here bringing a gift. Um, they would say, well, you, you came here from the realm of your ancestors carrying this gift and that gift that you carry, that medicine I would call it that you carry, um, you came here to deliver because it's deeply needed. And this, uh, this medicine that you carry is also connected specifically to certain ancestors that also carry this medicine. Um, and so there's this relational context of um, where the word community includes the living and the non-living, uh, as in a lot of uh, other cultures. Um, and that we come into the world to, to bring this, um, and then the role of the village or society should be to notice and track what that is in the person and then start drawing it out. You know, it's, it's like that, uh, the word education comes from the Latin word educare. And it doesn't mean to fill you up with information until you get your doctor's degree. It actually means to draw forth from within, to, to pull it out. Um, and so the role of a teacher wasn't to fill you up. It was to cultivate and pull these threads of what I see in there. This genius you carry, I want. we need that. Uh, and so initiatory rites of passage societies, those experiences were in, uh, were uh, to activate um, the memory of those agreements or the memory of that that gift. It's like um, it's already in you. Um, and to realign you with that uh, with that medicine offering that you came here to deliver. Um, and I think it was, uh, Joseph, it was Joseph Campbell who said, you know, if you want to know the, the popular mythology of the day, <clears throat> it's very easy. You just look around and see what the largest buildings are. And so we know the largest mythological constructs of the day are economic centers and commerce centers. And we could say 5,000 years ago, they were uh, pyramids. <laughs> burial grounds, sacred centers, um, stone circles, just all these different. Um, and so the mythology of your culture then um, ascribes what's important. And that enters into education and all the different things. So you, instead of coming into the world like you have a gift to offer, we have to figure out what that is and, and cultivate it out of you, is that um, these are the values of the culture you're born into and here's your occupational handbook. Go to school, choose one of these. And if you're fortunate, they'd line up. If you're not, then you're in trouble. Um, and you end up doing global summits and talking to people about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Transformative coaching. <laughs> That's what I see this as too. Um, so this uh, one mythology is in service to a uh, 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 society that is um, driven by all the isms, you know, and uh, the shadow isms of the day, beyond sexism, racism, and all the other isms that, that uh, become the, the mythology of, of a society. An initiatory, societies and rites of passage societies, the, um, the purpose of the initiatory experience was to connect you to a personal mythology. Um, like this, this uh, 
of this poem called Follow Your Name, and in there it says, if, if, you're, not, uh, if you're not connected to the bone memory, if you're not connected to your personal mythology, the bone memory of who you are, you'll likely be living an existence that's not entirely your own. And the life you know you li must live is the one standing a few paces in front of you, waiting for you to remember. And, um, and so there's this, uh, in this awakening that uh, this festival focuses on, uh, it's kind of like that saying, you know, if you, the truth will set you free, but first it's going to hurt like hell. <laughs> so as we awaken, we awaken to all the ways in which things may not be um, as I thought they were. Um, and and, so we, and that, that acknowledgement can, can be painful, um, just like birth is painful. Um, and just like great journeys uh, be often begin in darkness. Um, and so there's that, what I call the seeding time, the dark time is when the seeds go in the, in the soil. And, and, um, and so essentially we've been in that dark time. Um, seasonally, we entered into the dark time of year uh, and, and uh, at the end of October, we'd say Samhain in the Celtic tradition, um, where it's the darkest time of the year until the winter solstice when the light starts returning. Um, and most people misunderstand the darkness is that's where the beginning is. Things don't begin with the light, things begin in the dark. Um, and it's, uh, I think it, it, it's, we have a culture often that's perpetually looking for the bright and shiny light and they forget that no, it's in the dark is where these things begin. Right. Um, that's where I feel like, you know, that we are right now. and. What, it, what occurred to me is that, you know, we, when we started this interview, um, I, I forgot to read your bio, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so we just like d d dove right into it, right? <laughs> and now that we're like circling back, I'm really glad <laughs> because of everything that we talked about without naming it, you know, um, we were able to discover it together in this present, mm -hmm. you know, this present time, this present way of being together. So, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I, I like the way that that, that happened. And, um, and, you know, I would like to, you know, invite you, um, to, to share, you know, um, what what types of of journeys or you know ritual prescriptions or um, ways that you uh, help people get in contact you know with the darkness and the unknown and these different imaginal realms? Um, Let's say if, if you have a method of um, if you have a spiritual tradition you're already aligned with within that tradition they have a uh, a prescriptive way of connecting and opening that door that usually involves stillness, silence, and solitude. Um, and uh, we can say all of the all of the major religions on the planet actually began with somebody doing a, a vision fast, a vision quest, you know. Buddha and Jesus and Muhammad, and all these uh, great teachers that actually uh, fasting, solitude, exposure to the natural world um, was the access route uh, to surrender, um, and then through the surrender to a new, a new, to the third thing, to become aware of what is the third thing. And it's interesting that after all of these experiences, when they came back is actually when they began their, to offer their teachings, their medicine, their gift to the world. Um, so we can see in all these uh, sacred stories that, oh, there's, there's a, a proven method here. Um, and I might need to distill it down a little differently than 40 days in the desert. <laughs> or under a tree or up on a mountaintop. Um, 
but even distilling it down to um, uh, if you can connect in with nature or uh, something from nature, I think it definitely helps. Um, the tendency that we tend to, uh, our nervous system tends to be activated at the level of the energy that's around us. Um, and if we're not conscious of that, then we just kind of move at that level of energy. To begin to disengage that can simply be by uh, changing your breathing pattern, which shifts, uh, sh moves you between what's called the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, so that you can drop down. And there's, uh, you know, the four states of, of awareness are fight, flight, freeze, and stillness. You know, the meditative state. <laughs> I'm going to say faint. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, so first of all, noticing where we are, kind of what's the baseline. Um, so if I just took a breath, closed my eyes, took a breath, and if I had five minutes in my office or wherever I am to be to do this, and then just notice what shows up all by itself without me efforting to do anything, and I just notice. Don't judge, just notice. And take another breath. Um, and so what you're doing is you're just check, taking a baseline and you may notice what goes on physically, what goes on in your images, what goes on in your thoughts. And even noticing what happens all by itself when you're in that place and you hear the phrase, you're welcome here. You're welcome here. You have something important to offer. And even when you hear those phrases, notice, are there gatekeepers that come up to meet them? Maybe doubt uh, or something that blocks it. It doesn't quite go in. Um, or is there some phrase or belief system that, that shows up to stop it at the gate? Um, uh, so again, just noticing what shows up all by itself when you're in state of receptivity and you hear the phrase, you're welcome here. And then the second one, you have something important to offer. So uh, the, there's a statement of, of belonging and a statement of worth. Um, and we could truly say that, that most challenges for people will funnel down into one of these two wounded places. Excluding trauma is a third category, but, but generally speaking, worth and, and belonging are kind of the foundational ground. Um, and you may have had a different experience when you heard one versus the other phrase. And it can point you to, oh, I have, some, I have a gatekeeper that's pretty strong, say, around worth. Like, I feel welcome, but to believe I have something important to offer, I don't know. I don't know that I can believe that. It's like, oh, well, there's the work. There's the work. How? Uh, and so it's it can be as simple as first identify what those places are. It's like when I say Grandmother Moon brings those things from shadow into light over and over and over again. So what we're, um, it's being aware of the, the saboteur within ourself that blocks the very thing that we say we want by having the thing we want offered. And then all of a sudden we, we shield ourselves from it. And it's unconscious um, sometimes, are you right? You don't. Or there's a physical sensation that when you hear, when you're in a receptive noticing state and you hear the words, you're welcome here, and all of a sudden I feel this tightness guarded sensation that happens here um, that's not connected in this moment. Um, so it's like, huh, what is that? And how has that been, um, you know, how has that core belief or core sensation been uh, navigating me through a life of repetitive experiences that are not satisfactory? Um, so it's a, there's also the shifting of paradigms that I'm alluding to that is a shift from um, 
that only by extreme effort can you receive. Um, and this is a, the, the other paradigm which it, it has al also a great deal to do with your willingness to be open to receive, not the amount of effort. Um, and so it's a, a little bit of a shift in paradigm um, from a victim consciousness to much more of an open receptive. To allow. It's a lot, yeah, an allowing. And so um, that important piece of becoming aware of those gatekeepers, and maybe they need, often they need acknowledgement and, and gratitude, because maybe they have been there and, and have protected somebody. You know, this, well, this is what I learned, and this kept me connected to my family or to this, and, and so it, and so the question is, is it still working? Um, or is it simply keeping you disconnected from yourself and who you came here to be and what you came here to offer? Um, and then beyond all, as you move towards that, um, as you get that clarity, um, and I would on it like on a medicine wheel, I would put this clarity place of the East, this awakening. As, as we get clear, what organically wants to happen is we want to move into some kind of expression, action, manifesting energy. The more clear we are, the more organically we want to, to bring that into some expression, manifesting energy out in the world. Um, so I would offer you this uh, simple ritual of the first part, the stillness, the awareness of the, the gatekeepers. Um, maybe along those two statements that went on worth and belonging. And um, on the, uh, maybe in your room, if you're doing this in, a, in an apartment or if you're doing it in nature, just take a, a stick or draw a line across the dirt or uh, create a threshold. You're here and then there's over here. On the other side of the, the line, put either a candle or if you want to build a fire, if you're out in nature, you can put it as long as there's fire on this side. And at this line is where you have this meeting. The, this is the gate. This is the threshold. This is where um, are there parts of me that, you know, can't believe that I'm welcome or believe that I have worth. And this is the place of reconciliation, this place of working with these things and maybe seeing how they have come to, to support you in your life in some way and not work anymore. And then um, when you have that knowledge, when you have that awareness, and usually not before because it really won't work if you do it pre too fast or impulsively. But once you have that awareness um, and there's a sense of thank you to these ones that parts of myself that did this, even though it's limiting, now I'm ready to step beyond. Um, and once I step across that threshold, um, what I would suggest if, if you're outside and you've made a mark in the in the dirt or if you're in an apartment and you put down a broomstick and you cross it, once you step across the threshold toward the fire, I want you to turn around and remove the threshold. Move the stick, erase the line, and it's like there's, there's a commitment here um, that you're stepping towards this fire. And what is the fire? The element of fire is manifesting creativity it's where vision begins to take form. It's where spring moves into summer. Um, and, and when you step across that, um, maybe the first action you take is you light another candle or three candles. You, you'll build this fire. And if you're in the woods, you maybe build up the fire. Um, and then ask yourself this question once you've stepped across this line and you've built the fire up a little more. Um, what action am I guided to take at this time in my life? And here's the important thing. Don't let it be about your, your life path. No, like that's way too bad. Like right now, the, the, the closer in the time frame, um, in the space and time, it can be, um, the better. So if you step across that line and you say, um, what action can I take in this moment? Uh, or what action am I, am I guided to take? Um, do that thing. 
It says start, you know, build the fire up. Well, you know, just build it up. It's not important that you know why why you're being guided to do what you do, uh, or that you understand it. That's that's secondary. Um, as long as it's within your integrity, do it, um, and don't let it be too far out. Um, let it be in that moment, and um, and then it'll create a thread of a conversation. That once you do that thing, something else will happen. And then you follow that thread. And so this is the way you begin to uh, enter into the conversation with guidance uh, from your sacred source, whatever, whatever name that goes by for you, and follow it um, with, uh, my main, you know, again, maintain your integrity as you follow these things. But, um, but it can be very simple. Um, and, and let it be simple. Again, don't make it so big that, like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. Well, what kind of guy? It's like, no, that's too big. What do you want to do? How about this moment? Or this day? Or this week? Or when you go home to see your children tonight? Um, and again, once you start the conversation of, of uh, receptivity, listening, and following, um, you, deepen the, you deepen the conversation uh, in conversational engagement so that the, the get, you get more. Um, guidance doesn't have to take a long time. It actually is, can be like that. If you're willing for it to be like that, it'll happen like that. <laughs> um, so that, that's a, it's, it's a simple method that I use occasionally when I want to start the conversation. <laughs> by by um, listening and, and being in the immediacy and not having to understand why, just moving with, with what feels, feels right in the next step and then the next step and then the next right. step. Yeah, we have this uh, tendency, the, what we call the, anal the paralysis of analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and I, my background is psychology and psychotherapy, so I, was, I had to get out of, a lot. I had to unlearn a lot, which is um, we like to ask why. And we forget that why is like water. It's fluid. It changes. Um, and it's going to be different this week, next week, and next year. Um, so, but, we th but we think of why as some kind of fixed construct of, that remains eternal. Mm -hmm. And so don't ask why. Ask yourself, what action can I take in light of this, in this moment? What action am I guided to take? So it narrows the gap between what one experiences and the action that, of guidance that they follow mm. instead of filling it up with years of why. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, it can be that simple. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. So what else? Uh, what action can I take? <laughs> um, well, I think this is a beautiful um, place to, you know, com completeness. Um, and um, if, if, if people would love to uh, hear more about you or um, access a, a, a free, your free gift that you're offering, would you like to share about that? Yeah, so how that works, if you, um, the, the link for the free gift will take you to um, a place to sign up for the newsletter, and you automatically will get um, a audio version of a drumming story that I do called Singing Stone. It's a, a story of the initiatory journey. Um, so as soon as you get up, that's the immediate gift you get is the free story. It's an audio drumming story that you get to download to your computer. The second part is, of all those that do sign up, um, if you'll put somewhere in there the name of this uh, festival, so it'll cue me, it's like, oh, that's where you saw this, then your name will be entered into a drawing, along with all the others that indicate that, um, for a free cowrie shell uh, divination reading. What's a calorie shell divination reading? It's a form of, uh, so the word divine to look into, um, 
it's a way of entering into a conversation uh, with the sacred in regards to um, your questions or concerns. There is a write-up that you'll see in the in the information where I put here's what it's all about. Um, it's a form of, of divination tool that offers, a, we could say, a reading a information about here's what's going on at different levels. Um, so if somebody says, you know, I'm struggling with this, what's going on? I don't know how to unmend this. Or then we look in what is happening. Um, it could be ancestral. It could be, you know, some other place that's coming into your into the field that's causing these issues. Um, and then different than other kinds of readings where you simply just get a lot of information. Um, uh, Cowrie shell divination offers ritual prescriptions. So what I gave at the end of this was just a general ritual prescription that involved the element of fire um, as the manifesting force and energy of, of, of awakening. Um, in a divination reading, you get individualized prescriptive rituals that address what whatever the questions or concerns that come up are. Um, and you can read more about it. Yeah. On, on the link. Thank you. Thank you for your generous offering and uh, for your your generous way of being here today. Yeah, thank it's, you for the invitation. It's been fun. Got a lot. I got a lot out of it. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's an honor to have had this time to, to get to know you better. So thank you very much. Me as well. And so happy spring equinox to all the listeners. <laughs> Day of awakening. <laughs> and thank you, Cater. I appreciate you. You're quite welcome. You go well. Bye.